Oh, uh, I am Simon Harvey. I'm the current chair of the Marlborough Sheep and Beef Farmer of the Year Trust. And on behalf of that trust, I would like to welcome all the viewers to this webinar today. Um, our competition aims to identify and promote farmers who are not only productive and profitable, but are also careful stewards of their land and active contributors to the community. In our opinion, the Dawkins family exemplifies these ideals and they are very worthy winners of this competition. For any farmer who really wants to do better, I believe you'll find this production well worth watching. Now, um, as we go through the webinar, there will be the opportunity to type in questions if, if you've got any, any um, anything that you would like to know. And Rhiannon Murray is just going to show you now how you can do that. So hopefully that makes sense. So look, I would like to um, pass over to the Dawkins family now and the, and the webinar that they have made. Um, and I hope you really enjoy it. Thanks, Rhiannon. and Julia, the senior half of the family. We've been married for 53 years, so Julia's been here all that time of life. Bred for son, diabolical. Have turtled down as young adults and they uh, all take a keen interest in the uh, further afield in Southland and Waikato, the, um, the other two are um, spending a fair bit of time on farm on a daily basis. For the past 10 months since the competition was judged, Jess and I have been running the livestock operation. I'm Jess, also known as Mum to our two toddler girls, Ellie and Rosalie, who keep me very busy running farm errands and helping Chris and Richard where I can. So today you'll see a combination of management from today, but on decisions from the past. So thanks for tuning in and enjoy the show. Cool. Hi everybody, welcome back to another edition of Beef and Lamb New Zealand's Seen and Heard. And this one's a bit of a special one. We're doing double duty here as a, a Seen and Heard podcast and also as a, a virtual field day, if you like, for the Marlborough Sheep and Beef Farmer of the Year 2021. So we're joined by Chris and Richard Dawkins. A um, bit of background before we, we get across to them and talk about them and their business. And, and um, that's what we're going to be talking about over the next hour, going into some detail in what they do and basically why they've won the award. The the Marlborough Sheep and Beef Farmer of the Year Award is about promoting sustainable and innovative sheep and beef farming businesses. There's a Marlborough Sheep and Beef Farmer of the Year Trust, which is a non-profit organisation dedicated to identifying excellence in farming in the Marlborough region via comprehensive and wide-ranging judging cr criteria. So the objective of this webinar slash podcast to highlight the business success factors of this competition winner and through sharing their philosophies, their operating systems, their management program that's uh, employed by the Dawkins Pyramid of Farming Vision, the vision of the trust that the wider community will benefit from these insights. So look, I'll uh, welcome on now um, remotely. We're doing this over Teams, so the net's working well today. The, there's no rural and this should go well. Oh, Chris 
and you're going to throw this one out there and you who answers it. Give us the, the, the snapshot, uh, who you guys are, what your business is. I'll start with Eric uh, here. We're a, uh, we're a family based farming business at the confluence of the Avon, the Tumble and the Waihopai Rivers in the, um, in the Waihopai Valley. Uh, Julia and myself have been uh, farming as a husband ship since 1978. It's a 602 hectare property plus a 30 hectare lease a little bit further down the valley. Approximately 468 hectares we call effective sheep and cattle. We have a 100 vineyard, 9 of pine and um, We would have an average annual rainfall of about 780 mils, but approximately seven months of the year is spiritual deficit. So, uh, Julia and I farmed as a partnership up until uh, June 2020, and um, under son Richard and his wife Jess have taken over the lease of the agricultural operation. So, um, that's pretty much us in a, um, in a nutshell, Aaron. We're about 250 kilometres inland from uh, Richard. And so, Richard, you're um, formally sort of taking over the business since June 2020, but what's sort of been your pathway to that point? Have you been on the farm for a while before you to work with Chris? Yeah, so my uh, wife and I um, recently came home in 17 and and had spent a significant I had spent a significant time away from the farm um, nine leaving school so um, yeah it, it was great to be home and um, yeah involved, um, started last financial year Jess and I purchased the stock plant it was an interesting time a lot a lot on farm so in 2016, we developed what we call the Stage 1 vineyard, which was a 50 hectare development. And uh, two years ago now, uh, developed Stage 2, 44 hectare. So between two vineyard developments and session planning, um, we're actually at the same time, purchased 187 hectares of the neighbours as well. So. A fair bit going. A few changes from when I was much younger. Um, a bit of a different between work going on at the lock and and videos. so an interesting time to take over. And yeah, my dad having obviously just won the my Richard Fair, obviously a lot to live up to. So Jess and I will give it a good back and hopefully continue the legacy. So talked a bit about the farm itself and talked about the the family that's involved but I guess tell us not uh, finances are sort of I don't want to get into the dollars and cents yet but where do you make your money on the farm what what do you run on the place Currently, would be would be classified as a um, sheep and cattle enterprise 50 50 stock between sheep and cattle um, we've tried to spread the risk by um, future to the uh, into the mix and um, we've also got um, vineyards so I guess in essence we've the income streams would be timber for, for, from well, log sales say also um, carbon from the trees we've got the um, the sheep and the associated sheep meat and wool we've got cattle which is spread between carryover dairy cows that we cycle back into the dairy industry we've got uh, Jersey bulls that we lease and subsequently sell to dairy farmers as herd sires, and um, we also have um, dairy as well. And then on top of that, we've got um, some Patrick's got a bee business based on the farm. Richard's got a uh, firewood business where he uh, is able to utilise waste wood. Um, the vineyard is split between half of it. It's actually leased out for a regular monthly income. The other half we manage ourselves for as contract growers. 
and um, and between times we actually have a, a contracting service, so we actually manage the leased vineyard for the um, for the lessee as well as um, doing our own uh, vineyard work. As I say, we're not going to talk a lot about the vineyards, but it does illustrate you've got a relatively complex farming business. Now, there's a fair bit going on. We're going to drill into the, the pastoral side of things. Who else? How does it all run in terms of people on the places? The two of you, or other family members, other staff. What? Who? Who works day to day and helps out, or even season to season? Family members tend to uh, come and go, particularly in the younger formative years, with regard to our uh, university and what have you. Um, always had a um, permanent staff member who's been on the property for 42 years since um, we both started here at the same time. But um, it's, it's interesting that you suggest it's a, a relatively complex business, Aaron. This kept up, kept coming up um, regularly during the Monitor Palm program. I didn't think it was particularly um, complicated, but others had uh, difficulty getting their head around it. I guess it's what, um, what you enjoy and what you grow up with. Yeah, it's yeah, so a complex relative, and that's the sort of thing you enjoy having those multiple business operations, multiple spirits. Yeah, they're all very much uh, complimentary. Yep, no, no, they um, they all walk in um, quite comfortably. Yep. What about you, Richard? Is that you, you got a particular passion for part of the business, or are you enjoying the parts, like Chris? Yes, certainly enjoy the um, multiple aspects um, of the um, purchasing the stock plant and machinery. Obviously, Jess and I mainly concentrate on on the live side of the farm, and found a good value in local contractors just um strategic use of contractors seems to fill any voids um, in terms of labor so i just recently had um, spraying contractors in and for a week um use fencing contractors when required shearers do a very good job um we have very good relationship uh, with with the local um, tree planters um, so on the farm is, is just myself and I seem to be able to tick off the day-to-day -day work um, but just when things are falling a wee bit behind we will in contracts as a hand this decision to invest in, in, in with finance being very cheap at the moment possibly than we'll ever see again time it's a great so things efficiently ourselves we do all of the tractor work ourselves um, but have have very good good tractors and implements just to do things as efficiently as possible so it, it is busy it, it um, yeah gets busy from time. Um, very rewarding at the same time yeah one of the things I remember well from Lincoln was the capital for labour whenever you can. Now, the, of doing this this podcast, this webinar, is the amount of information I've been supplied from the judges that were involved. And sort of while we're on this topic of people and family, the other things they note, although, you know, um, the, the business is busy, we're going to talk about the high levels of performance you're achieving. Um, they noted, you know, as a family, you guys have a, all of you have a fairly high level of community involvement. Is that something as well that sort of drives you day to day to be tell us about what you do in the community and, and sort of what why you're motivated to do that yeah uh, it happens by design rather uh, it happens rather by air and rather than design um oh it's one of those situations the, the more you put into anything the more you put out the more you get out of it i enjoy um, mixing with motivated well, most people. One thing, when, um, I, um, a fairly active um, years ago on the um, New Zealand Sheep Council, which thoroughly enjoyed um, being with those motivated people on a regular basis. So um, when I retired, there was a, a little bit of a, um, a void to fill. So the Monitor Farm program was, I think, a um, logical extension to it. Yeah, no, most of it is not not planned. It just, there's an opportunity, so you take advantage of it. Uh, motivated was the key word Dad used. I'd, I'd like to say um, positive people as well. Um, really enjoy being 
being away from home for nine or ten years meant I had to play a bit of play catch up a bit in the industry and I found being involved in the agricultural community helps boost on and off farm knowledge yes yeah, surrounding myself with people is the key and I've found people that volunteer or people who participate in those extracurricular activities be it be it beef and lamb farming for profit or federated farmers or catchment um, those people are generally positive and um, motivated like dad said and, and a joy to be around they, they sort of boost you up so probably the reason I enjoy those community activities so and on sort of a theme my last sort of question on this one it was another one the, the just certainly information it was, it was a big one of the business is something time and effort into looked at different things can you give us a bit of a one of you or five between can you give an overview of how the business is governed at the moment the governance structures have got in place what you've tried what's worked what hasn't worked and yeah where you're at no formal structure as such but um do value our relationships that we have with um with a number of industry people all of whom can add value to to the business in their particular area of expertise um, we we meet regularly as a um, family probably easier to do it on zoom actually rather than when we're all together on um, on site so regular updates with the family to keep abreast of developments and um, specialist help from from industry people as required for um, for guidance and help in, in any particular situation. It's um, something that I've always enjoyed the the planning side of uh, of the business. So um, do place quite a bit of emphasis on getting good guidance and um, and getting it right. Yep. And I noticed in your presentation, Chris, you said you're a, a problem solver, you enjoy a challenge. All right, so let's talk about some of those sort of problems and, and outcomes. Let's start talking about the, I guess, the, the, the sheep and beef farm side of things. Um, let's start with the sheep system. In a, again, in a nutshell, the elevator pitch or the thumbnail, what, what sort of, what's the sheep system you're running on the place? Pretty, pretty simple, um, pretty simple system. We've, we've got a breeding finishing flock of ewes that make up about half the total number of stock units. Um, that's a, a closed flock as such. We vehemently protect the, um, the sheep flock, but we um, actively trade cattle, but with precautions um, and would probably best be described as a um, dairy support system in terms of carryover cows, leased bulls for the dairy farmers and the, um, and the dairy beef. Yep. So um, how many hoggets? Finishing everything. What's the what's the, the oh, outline? The, how does the system work? About uh, fourteen hundred ewes, four hundred hoggets. All all animals are um, are mated, and um, we work on having a, a reasonably good clearance of uh, lambs at weaning time in November. Yep. And what's the genetic review plot? Well, my pride and joy was uh, a flock of Corridale ewes uh, in my heyday I was a new old farmer of the year but um, unfortunately over time the value of wool as a percentage of the sheep income has diminished in that first decade of my farming career wool percent of my uh, sheep income and it, it peaked one year at 65 percent but over the decades since it's just um, continued to diminish whereas um, nowadays it's probably only about uh, two or three percent of our sheep income consequently we have changed to a more of a crossbred type flock, although possibly best described as composite, where that focuses very much on meat production, but also conscious of, of, of the wool attributes, but um, yeah, primarily um, making use of um, some of the more recent genetics in terms of um, texels and, uh, and fins and uh, east regions and the likes. And what sort of lambing percentage are you aiming for out of the, out of the, the ewe flock for a start off? Oh, um, I should um, 
probably pitch in uh, my department these days. Um, firstly, should should thank Chris and Jane Earl um, from down in the Greta Valley there, who are the ram breeders. Um, uh, long as the as the maternal sire, um, which and as Dad are very much focused on meat production, um, which certainly ticks ticks all of the boxes for us here, and it has had um, very good success um, in other competitions um, as well. Well, last year's winner of the Marlborough Sheep and Beef Farmer of the Year, um, Fraser Avery at Bonnevere, also runs the um, long Down Ram, or Long Down Breed, and um, also Stu Campbell, who won the Mint Lamb competition last year, um, won it with a Long Down. So um, quite a widely adopted and um, performing you. Um, here at the Pyramid, we the, the goal these days is to have a 160% um, lambing. So scanning mid 190s, 190 to 195% in the mixed age and two tooths combined, and, and look to clear um, to do 160% um, by weaning. So those figures are from scanning until weaning. Yep. And have you done it? Um, well, I guess this is going to flow onto the indoor landing yep. conversation. Um, a, there was a sudden drastic change in lamb death rates uh, five years ago, which was when we uh, adopted the indoor lambing system, which cut our triplet deaths in half. But it wasn't just the triplet lambs we were saving. We found the system uh, had a flow on effect outdoors and our farm wide survival um, improved significantly. So yes, we're every year we've lambed indoors, we've we've had a lamb death rate between 13 and 15 percent. Traditionally, it, it was anywhere from 20 20 percent in a good year to 25 percent death rate in a bad year. So that, that's not just the ones inside. You're talking the, the whole 1400 that, that's years across. Yes, across yep. all 1400 years. So indoors tradition, uh, outdoors with the triplets, traditionally we'd lose about one lamb in three. So say a 33% death rate. Mm -hmm. Indoors, we're, we're still losing, we're losing about 17% of those lambs. But what should be noted is a, the majority of those deaths, deaths can't actually be. So half of the 70% are actually lost before birth, so an abortion bug of some description, or they are still born, so they're fully developed but never breathe. The um, prevent deaths um, are very, very minimal, um, only a couple of difficult birth deaths each year, and some labs just tend to fall by the wayside and you know, as much colostrum as, as they need and, and special care and attention, but they fade away. So. Um, yeah, we're doing everything we can um, to maximise survival, but a 17% death rates and the death death rate in the triplets from scanning until weaning is is pretty much as good as we can get it. Yeah, and we will drill into that because it, it has been really interesting the the uh, not in kind but the indirect benefits of that system the whole flock, not just the ewes that are in the the indoor thing, but just so your target's 160. Have you got close? Have you done that? Or is that what you regularly do? Where are you at? Since beginning the indoor lambing system in 2017, yes, I yep. believe we've achieved 160% each year. Uh, yes, we're, we're yet to, we're actually doing our final weaning draft tomorrow to finalise numbers, but it's looking like we'll be around 164, 165%. What's, do you finish everything on the place or? Um... Uh, traditionally, we always have. Um, so this year, uh, we've actually achieved so far a 91% clearance of lambs prime off mum, and the average was 41 kilos. So, yep. so far, we've only been left with 100 lambs. And yeah, I've, I've uh, tended to adopt a policy of let's shift our focus, probably always the focus really, let's just shift focus to next season's lamb production. So. If I am able to sell those lambs store at weaning um, for a reasonable price, we'll let them go and um, put yep. that higher quality feed and new lambs or or young bull calves and um, focus on next year's production. So we do have the ability to finish them, but I, I just think the feed is um, better put into into preparing for next year. Yeah, 
and it's always that you know those two things the the lambing percentage again versus the the lamb live weight gain but um that was one of the things the judges noted was the the excellent overall you flocked um on the it's about three years of information wasn't it went into the judging ewes weaning 60.5 kilograms of lamb per u mated whereas the average around is closer to around in that region so what's the getting the lambing percentage is, is one thing and you've talked about the the, the indoor lambing and, the, and looking after the triplets better and the flow on effects of that but how are you getting those lamb live weight gains as well when you've got so many multiples on it's um comes back to the overall system, I think. Um, well, it, it starts today, really, where it's the day after our main ewes year, and this morning we've been through the ewes and drafted out the light condition ones. So it's the overall system which concentrates on ewe body condition, yep. priority feeding, soil fertility, improved pastures, and then intensive management. So we've gone through today and, and drafted out anything condition score three or less, which will be priority fed on or brassica through. So all of the ewes to a condition score of 3.5 minimum in mid-February when the teasers go out. The condition main ones for the year are shearing and scanning. But we're doing it all the time. Any any treatments in between, such as dipping or vaccinating, or even just when you're shifting mobs, you could potentially pull a couple of stragglers out. Yep. Um, so so constant body condition scoring and priority feeding. So at the moment you've just shorn. So do you still put a hand on them then, or you do it by eye when they're fresh off shears? How you and and rest of the year are you actually physically putting a hand on them? Um, no, no, fresh off shears, it's very to pick on the drafting gate. You need to be practical about these things. And one of the, one of the bonuses of sick shearing here is um, it's never particularly hard to pull out those lower condition ones. So while best practice tends to suggest you should go through and, and put your hand on them, um, yeah, we find it very, very practical and very easy um, to, to do it year round, really. But particularly um, the week following shearing. Yeah. And so how many ewes at the moment, this, this you've just drafted them, how many have you got at that three or under body condition score? And what are you going to do with them? Well, the, the ewes and the ewes did particularly well this year. So in a normal, we have about 20% of the ewes yep. out and uh, to the looser form for the mm -hmm. summer, but um, fairly well, and it would be 10% um, have come out. So... Yeah, that, that will free up a bit of feed, a bit of extra feed for the ewe lambs, which we'll aim to mate um, at the start of April, a target of 48 kilos, so a bit more loose end to pump into them. And the, the key thing, you know, you're talking about a minimum of 3.5 February, how are you keeping those heavy ewes heavy all the way through? You know, in a summer dry environment, it's easy for them to, again, lose a bit of weight post weaning. <laughs> I'll let Dad answer that one, who's got some good stories about well, it's not that easy for them to lose weight around here, is it? No, I, I think you appreciate the environmental um, area, particularly a boy like you, um, for South. We we have 2,600 hours of sunshine every year. It's um, it's an environment that's very conducive for performance, sheep performance. It's not that great in terms of soil really a recognised um, high lamb growth area compared with, say, um, closer to the coast south of uh, south of Blenheim. But um, a combination of, um, of things, climate, um, yeah, I guess when you've been doing it for 40 odd years, you've become a little bit blasé and you know what works and what doesn't work. So um, you just have a, um, a, a plan in place and just follow it each year. Um, always been a, a bit of a fan of planning, recording and monitoring. So the results become very predictable. Yep. 
But what's the plan, though, for those heavier ewes? Where do they go? What do they eat all summer? What sort of country you put them on? What are they? You've got well, this year, the lucerne and that for the lights. What do you do with it? Yeah. Well, this year being um, particularly um, with wet through early December, we, we've got a fair bit of tag about. Um, so those heavier ewes will just go up doing a clean up job on tag and we'll look to summer fallow um, about 20 hectares. So we'll have a thousand ewes um, hurriedly cleaning up tag and, and try and get those paddocks sprayed out in reasonable time to conserve a bit of summer moisture for drilling in the autumn time. So um, yeah, this year in particular, a lot of tag to clean up and um, generally those heavier ewes, yeah, will just be run on the rougher hill blocks for the summer. Be grazing the, the specialist crops such as your summer brassicas or, yep. or the lucerne. All we're so, doing, yeah. Aaron, maintaining the body weight of the ewes so um they it's only a, a maintenance ration so providing they've got good water good shade and a little bit of scope it's it's not difficult yep. what are you, you like your, your semi-improved pastures what are you based are your ryegrass coxfoot you're using sub clover what are you using on these these uh your, your hill blocks the, well, if you started on the river flats, um, which is about 25% of the property, that they historically have always been in Lucerne for that specific purpose. Um, moving up onto the um, rolling clay country, which you can get a tractor over the bulk of, which is our main lambing platform, um, always had a phobia about perennial ryegrass and the, um, the, the effects of um, endophytes. Consequently, um, initially when I bought the property, we went through a uh, fescue development. But then over time, when the novel endophytes became available and we um, learned uh, more to appreciate the effects of ergovaline and Lotrim B, um, have actually gone on to the um, novel endophyte ryegrasses. And um, reasonably difficult to maintain a high um, legume sward in that particular pasture. It's heavy clay country and it's Dick Lucas's. Dick Lucas describes the farm as a ryegrass factory, and that um, ryegrass does enjoy mm -hmm. it here. The hill country is a slightly different beast, and that not quite so aggressive, complementary pasture. So the um, legumes do do better up there in terms of a percentage of the pasture mix, and and we've tried um, most of them over um, over a long period of time. Sure, um, sub clover gives some um, very good results. We've um, tried other annuals in terms of the top flowering ones, um, your arrow leaf and your balanza and what have you. White clover um, tends to perform very much like a uh, annual in our summer dry environment, and that in a dry year it will die, but there seems to be sufficient. But it wasn't just the triplet lambs we were saving. We found the ewes, so um, they. Well, um, cleaning up tag. The time when the novel endophytes became available, and we um, learned. Um, more to appreciate the effects of ergovaline and Lotrim B, um, have actually gone on to the um, novel endophyte ryegrasses. And um, reasonably difficult to maintain a high um, legume sward in that particular pasture. It's heavy clay country and it's Dick Lucas's, Dick Lucas describes the farm as a ryegrass factory and that um, ryegrass does enjoy mm -hmm. it here. The hill country is a slightly different beast in that not quite so aggressive complementary pasture species. So the um, legumes do do better up there in terms of a percentage of the pasture mix. And, and we've tried um, most of them over um, over a long period of time. Sure, um, sub clover gives um, very good results. We've um, tried other annuals in terms of the top flowering ones, um, your arrow leaf and your balanza and what have you. White clover um, tends to perform very much like a uh, annual in our summer dry environment and that in a dry year it will die, but there seems to be sufficient.
Simon, why don't we grab a few questions from Richard and Chris while we wait? That's, that's a good idea, uh, Lucy. Um, Richard and Chris, can you hear that? Uh, are you able to answer, um, have a go at answering um, those questions that have come up so far? Yeah, we can manage that. Rhiannon's sorting the technical difficulties, is she? Yes, I think so. Okay, oh, well, we'll um, start on the questions. Um, we we just had to log out, so they've disappeared, but um, Ellie's uh, around um, the cost of feed. Um, the, the lucerne's are permanent pasture, so renewed every 10 years, um, so not overly expensive. In the summer brassica, we um, we have our own, own tractors and um, implements, so particularly with direct drilling is, is a very cost-effective feed. We work on um, four to five cents per kilo of dry matter for the summer brassica, so um, yeah, quite cheap and effective. You want to do prof moots one? What's prof moot got to say? Uh, the tag on the hills in a summer dry environment will provide maintenance uh, ME of about eight is standing hay, but the tag in a wet environment is likely to be six or less and declining. Brown top and other species decaying with the wet, so it's below maintenance, which is why it needs to be dealt with ASAP in the spring and summer. I couldn't agree more in that the carryover cow has been very effective at um, harvesting that um, dry rank feed reasonably economically. They themselves probably aren't a particularly profitable stock unit in their own right, but they certainly add a lot of value to the um, sheep enterprise and also the young cattle by removing that tag to make way for the uh, annual legumes and legumes that come away in the autumn rain. Um, it, funny enough, it does keep reasonably well on the um, on the hill in that we are relatively dry over the summer, so um, it, it's not difficult to clean it up under normal circumstances. Okay, next one from Lucy. You enjoy gathering data on many aspects of your stock performance. How do you store it and use it so you can make improvements? Uh, that's a really good question, Lucy. And um, when I got home, um, yeah, I was full of gusto and wanted to, to try out some of these new software packages. And um, yeah, we we signed up signed up to one of the new ones and um yeah it was it was quite flash and had all the bells and whistles and came at quite a cost um it was very clunky and what was frustrating was i'd um, load up the computer to to find some of this data and, and while i was still loading the program um dad had had his diary open um with the info right there um so after persevering with it for a couple of years um, I've, I've actually gone back to yeah, just the more traditional farm Murray and, and Microsoft Word and spreadsheets. Um, if, if you're relatively organised and tidy, um, I, th I think that's as effective as, as anything really. So pretty basic in that regard. In terms of using it to make improvements, um, if you're not measuring things, um, you, you can't, can't gauge performance. Um, so, so yeah, just just have a list of KPIs and look to improve on those each year, um, and and with fairly fairly good consistent results, we can be fairly happy with where we're at. But if if performance isn't up to the regular standard, you'll you'll have to look at what you've done that season and make the required adjustments. Yes, Lucy, my system was very much um, paper based. Um, just had KPIs that I recorded every year. The uh, graph that was displayed earlier on regarding the percentage of come uh, derived from wool from the sheep was just just one of a number of of, of graphs that I just update on a uh, on an annual basis. So I've got a fairly uh, a fairly wakey file of um, after recording forty years of data. So. Um, there's numerous files to cover various aspects of the um, of the business, but 
readily available. Um, it's something that I'm reasonably keen and passionate about, so relatively easy on the uh, relevant information. Okay, from Thomas Harvey, do you have trouble with pests in the summer brassica? Um, in, in recent years, we've um, had very good establishment and yields. Um, what about in days gone by? Uh, not too bad. Probably work on a prevention rather than cure regime and that will include a, a little bit of law span in with the um, spray out of the paddock with um, with glyphosate prior to um, drilling. Use some um, use coated seed. Um, I yeah, just on the odd occasion, maybe slugs, but um, by and large, it's it doesn't seem to be a, an environment that's particularly plagued by uh, by pests. Okay, another one from Ali. What are the key aspects from lambing until weaning to achieve your growth rates of lambs off mum? Um, well, the key ones I'll mention will be uh, what, what we just talked about in the video was um, body condition scoring throughout the year. Um, we're certainly big believers in, in keeping the condition on the ewes and not fluctuating the, fluctuating the um, live weights too much. Um, condition score three and a half for mating. Um, you use ram harnesses. So after a couple of cycles, uh, once most of the ewes are in lamb, we'll certainly cut back the quality of their feeding um, through the late autumn and early winter. Um, but don't particularly want them losing a lot of weight and certainly uh, boost their feed, flush them um, prior to lambing. Um, certainly need to priority feed anything that is light condition or triplets uh, post scanning. Um, we are we are lambing relatively early here. Um, the 24th of July is, is when we kick off. So those early lambs are about 60 days old before we're actually really coming out of the winter and growing feed. So we we do lamb on high pasture covers. Um, you generally see recommendations of about 1,400 kilos of cover, and that might be might be um, perfect from a um, pasture utilisation uh, perspective. But to, to get through those first 60 days, we we really sort of need two two and a half thousand kilos of cover. So flush and lamb on 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 good covers of feed. Um, you know, stock lamb about eight eight sheep to the hectare. Um, yeah, that'd be the. I think it'd be fair to say that, um, the, as far as our system is concerned, the weaning weight is determined by what's happened prior to lambing, and that um, the whole the, the focus of the whole year is is the weaning weight of the lamb. So everything should be in place for us prior to lambing in terms of the condition score of the ewe and the quality of the pasture and that um, put quite a bit of emphasis on grooming paddocks on the lambing platform to ensure maximum weight gain. Bearing in mind, as was alluded to in the um, video, we, we're not actually in an area that's recognised as having high land growth rates, so it doesn't exactly come naturally. You have to put a, a fair bit of air to it. but. Um, yeah, I think it'd be fair to say that um, most of that activity starts at um, weaning time of the previous year. Okay, one final one uh, from Ellie as well. Uh, what is your average age of lamb at weaning? Uh, that that was um, calculated by Pete Anderson at, at the handout. Was it 92 days for the three years? Yeah, I would, I would say 90 to 95 days at weaning. Yeah, probably um, distorted a, a wee bit by the fact that we do actually do a skim draft prior to weaning and um, take out heavier lambs just to try and keep the, um, the, the maximum weight at weaning time below 25 kgs, maximum individual weight. Consequently, um, there is an earlier draft of, of younger lambs, but 
yeah, Pete's got a pretty good program and yeah, around about 90 odd days. Very good. Well, I think Rhiannon's um, saying we're good to go. So I would say keep the questions coming and, and we can go back to Q&A afterwards. Supplements or is it all to the two? What's the, how do you use it in the system? Uh, very much grazed in situ to um, get those 90% of the lambs up to 40 kilos yep. live weight at weaning. So uh, this is um, brought in and, and we do have a, uh, a couple of days. But um, difficult to, to buy in Lucy Hay these days with um, so many grapes on our, um, on our boundary, mm. on, on the valley floor. So... Um, yeah, Lucerne Hay has certainly historically been a, a very important part of the uh, of the diet. If I could um, just add a comment there about an it's important for for people to understand that Lucerne and our our environment, Opai Valley here, it does have a long period of dormancy, and we we can't actually graze it or stock it until the second or third week of September. So you have to be careful not to expose yourself to that winter dormancy. Mm. For very, very hectare of lucerne, um, we just about need twos of rice, um, particular, in particular your sort of winter Italians and annual rye grasses. Um, when do you leave? Uh, the um, first mosque off in the week of July, 24th yeah. of July. Um, so when you're not able to stock in November, you need a um, of of those winter active grasses onto the um, lucerne is great to shuffle the later lambing mobs onto, um, but even even they're probably a month old by then. Um, but where it is really beneficial is the later lambing hoggets, which um, start at, start lambing at the beginning of September. It's a great platform for them, and um, of course. Through the summer, if we can get get a, a wee bit of summer rain, the soon obviously stay and is growing out young lock. So, so while it, it certainly adds a huge amount of value, hence why we've got so much um, on and capable of growing it, you you do just have to be a bit careful not to not to overexpose yourself and also sort of have complementary um, other complementary. The Waihopa is completely devoid of artesian water. Consequently, it can all go dormant over summer in that there's mm -hmm. just um, insufficient moisture to uh, sustain it. It it will it will never die on you. Um, as soon as you get a uh, reasonable rain, you're back in business. But it would never save you in a drought. Nothing to tap in. That's an interesting disconnect, you know, because lucerne growing with the air temperature and tends to kick away. But why is that because, I mean, that's when your pastures are kicking into gear or... Uh, also to beat that, uh, you know, you were talking about when you go into a deficit and, and your pasture growth rates flatten out or bottom out. Um, it's relatively early lambing. Lucerne's not getting out of the gear until mid-September. Yeah, very much. The entire farming system is geared around the dry summer. Uh, we yep. tend to hit a soil moisture deficit here in the third week of October um, when pastures start wilting and going reproductive. So... First draft is generally the first week of November and then the main weaning in the week. Um, so you need, need to lamb earlier to to beat the climate, but um, fortunately it also coincides with, with the markets basically being at their peak. Yep. And it's, a good bit, um, it's a good bit warmer here, Aaron, than what it is in uh, North Otago or South Canterbury. We, we can grow grass during the winter. Um, what we are in the valley is we're on an elevated toe and it is quite warm. Um, there certainly isn't a lot of frost protection in the, yep. uh, the vineyard. Yeah, that's just why it caught my mind that, you know, with Lucerne being air temperature respondent, why there's that gap? But we're um, looking at what we've got to cover and the time we've got. I'm going to move on to the next part of the sheep system. 400 odd hots. Um, and I think I said you're mating them all. And then sort of what's your target medium and average? What do you what how do you get decision and where well historically you had to make your decision on what you were going to make 
in um, mid-January so you could complete your vaccination program in time for um, mating in, in late March as far as your um, uh, campylobacter vaccination and, and booster is concerned. So um, as a rule, um, we used to cull on the scales, anything that was lighter than about uh, five kilos. So um, you then had between mid-January and um, late March to get another uh, 15 was wanting to target a minimum uh, weight of about 50 kilos, 48, 50 kilos. Um, yeah, about you over that um, summer period, uh, over that um, summer autumn period to get up to a, uh, a yeah. minimum of uh, kilos. And is that why you're a minimum, not an average? You're, you're a minimum of 48 in your hoggets when they go to the range? That's, that's the target. Yep. Don't, um, don't always achieve it. Um, yeah, probably looking at an average of uh, probably looking at an average of about fifty. No, right, so that's pretty hefty, and it's a, I guess, reflection of the lamb live weight gain talking about and all that go into that. What do you get out of the end of your your you hog? Not well, that's an area where we need to um, need to focus on improvement, but uh, yeah, we're we're struggling to do a hundred percent. 85 to 100%. I'm sure a lot of listeners um, appreciate and um, have experience in sort of abortion um, plaguing um, hog. It. It's certainly an issue we contend with here and um, quite quite come up the answers. Um, it, it's a bit of an ongoing problem when you lose sort of 20, 20 to 30% of those lambs which have been sent um, that's sent back shifted focus last year and thought well if there's not a lot we can do about the abortions let's maximize the the lamb survival the ones which are born alive so with the indoor lambing system going going so well with the triplets we actually decided decided to lamb the hoggets indoors as well um, yep. so my goal was less than a 10 rate right, that's whole lamb. Um, that's excluding the abortions, of course, and um, we managed to do 9% um, of those 9% deaths. How many were preventable? Well, not many, I would suspect. We only had one from a difficult birth. Um, so I don't have abortion issues sorted. We're certainly um, maximising the lambs that are maximising the potential of the ones that are born alive anyway. Yep. We're on to... Um that that indoor lambing system or or the the because now it's across both triplets and hoggets but um just the last couple of things on the hoggett lambing what sort of ram do you put them to and out of the the 400 of the end dry at those live weight historically we've been um, very south down ram sourced locally um last couple of years we've actually been using a uh, a couple of charolais as as well um Long-term average figures, I would suggest you probably end up with about a third of them dry, a third of them carrying singles, mm -hmm. a third of them carrying twins. Yep. How'd you, and just out of interest, how'd you find the Charolais as a sire across hoggets? Lambing difficulties, etc. Or... I'll speak to that one. You you buy the stuff in the Charolais rams because... Um, general consensus seems to be you'll have a smaller birth weight but uh, in our environment um, yeah I mean you end up with great big heavy ewes and big lamb big hoggets mm. um consequently um you want them to be quite large as well um no, no matter what the breed uh no the Charolais done done very well for us um certainly have have a superior yield um, mm. conversion from live weight to calf weight, which is selling 80 units of mum, um, that yield becomes hugely valuable to you. So Sweet. it certainly ticks the boxes in terms of those calf traits and um, certainly can to use them. All getting good um, clearance of those off the hoggets, no problem. They're not hanging around as light tail end stalls or anything. You're getting a significant number of those away. Um, ten, ten, the, the mixed age ewes and yep. two tooths, yeah, very similar numbers. Yeah. 
um, albeit yeah, the month late, are quite at the peak of the schedule. But I think if you can get them get the hoggett lambs away from uh, before Christmas, then you should be pretty happy. Yeah, yeah. Historically, Aaron, we've had um, superior lamb growth rates with the hoggett lambs compared mm-hmm. with the ewes, and that, as Richard said, they're lambing them. They are yep. um, lambing on a, a decayed hogging platform. Um, they're all terminal sires, so supposedly full yep. of hybrid vigour. And, um, yeah, they, they certainly do in our environment. And and I guess one of the things for lamb live weight gain and ease of birthing, your you lambs, you hoggets, must be a reasonably significant live weight if you exclude lamb and that by the time they get a pretty already. Uh, that would be yeah. yeah. Yeah, the um, sheriffs certainly um, comment on them. <laughs> hey, let's um, talk about the. We've sort of talked about in lamb, lamb live weight gain. Obviously, one of your key targets to achieve you, and it has been the the tell us that indoor system. I guess the stages have been through what you've ended up with. How? It yeah, well, probably the the reason for doing it and the history behind the decision um, would be best explained to Dad. So he'll, he'll give you a bit of a rundown of, of the history of, of the issues we've faced with multiples and the challenges and could um, probably take over once we talk about the system itself. Back, had everybody a, just left the room. Had a very fertile corridor. Constantly, um, triplets were a bit of an issue and in spite of best endeavours, um, we just weren't making any progress in terms of survival of lambs. I was a lot of time in the paddock with them, and um, very disappointing results. Consequently, uh, during the monitor farm program, it was highlighted the fact that our death rate above average. Richard came home to having been away from uh, years, and um, he was a schoolboy, and we had broke he had experienced um, indoor animal systems in the UK, so um, he suggested it was uh, time for a change. And what were the changes, Richard? What did you see? What did you did to do? Yeah, no, no it, it was it had always always been an issue the um, management of the triplets and. Probably for the first time, we had the infrastructure in place. Um, recently had a large, we always had a covered yards, but extended those. And um, with myself being home, we had the labour. So, yeah, yeah, thought we'd give it a crack. And um, the, in year one, I, I mentioned it, we were very well supported by Beef and Lamb as an innovation farm. They on board in 2017 was year one and pretty much did everything by the box so we introduced supplements three weeks before they came indoors um we were we were strict with the hygiene um we, we were feeding the ewes once they left yards um to help with that diet adjustment and re- really really went off, um in terms of an intensity and as the years went on we just Things are a wee bit more practical, a bit easier to manage, and without compromising the performance of the system. So, so if we say the the general theme theme of the five years has been best practice, and then just modifying the system to suit. So, in in terms of results, like I mentioned earlier, we've we've gone from a long term death rate outdoors of a 33% to yeah, sort of 15 to 18 cent indoors. Yep. Um, and by this unproved year, more than half of them are, are abortion related deaths. Just walk up with a triplet you, she's scanned with triplets. What happens from then on? How does it, when do you take her into the shed? How long are they in for? What's the feed, etc.? cetera? You, you talked about modifying it to what works. What have you found works? Triplet management start. At, at scanning when they are identified and added onto superior feed. Um, the, the very much refined system we have now is actually going back to the start harnesses that used at making, which is very important in terms of identifying A, targeted feeding, and when they are going to live. So they're in three day age groups, so we can capture it with bringing them inside. So the the day before they're due to come inside, 
um, we'll start feeding feeding their supplements, which they have indoors, which is lucerne hay, and bought and they get quite comfy and, and put them in a lambing pen, which is generally those. So they're, they're fed and, and water and eating. Uh, once they am, they're just separated off into a bonding pen and watched for 24 hours. So over that period, we're just wanting to make sure the lambs have got up on their feed and um, and uh, sort of set to go outside, obviously, check the ewe's udder for milking ability. And if, if we think it's necessary, we, we will take one lamb or two lambs off and um, put them into the orphans. So it would be called a hybrid. I mean, if they come inside the day before they're due and they're born and then they're simply in the bonding pen for 24 hours, um, yeah, sort of after two days they're, they're off, we'll um, put them in the laneway and they'll wander off to their paddock. Yep. Is it uh, broadly wickets? The hoggets were was really interesting doing those. It, were, it was it was quite interesting to see the difference in behaviour and how how the system worked. Just having one or two lambs really made things a, a lot simpler. Um, when down in the morning and three triplets have lambed and you've got room around, it can be a bit of a challenge sometimes. But um, they mm -hmm. usually let you know if you've you've put the room in with them. Yep. Um, so the triplets were. Uh, the, the hoggets were, were a bit more straightforward, just with singles and twins. Um, they had a much lighter footprint than the triplets. I mean, a, a big triplet you can have 15 kilos of placenta in there, mm. um, so it creates a bit of a mess in the pens, um, quite a bit of new straw ride just to keep things uh, fresh, but the hoggets certainly had a lighter footprint and were easier to manage. Um, but no, the, the sheep are intensively managed here. They're used to being handled. They're used to being in the yards. Um, so, yeah, so both the triplets and the hoggets did really well. And they've certainly got good memories as well. Once they've been in so one year, they're um, quite at high come back the following year. Yeah. So there's the saying, and you've talked quite a bit about the impact this has had on the overall sheep system and the, the overall ewe survival and things, but saying... I remember being drummed into us, performance is vanity, profit is sanity. So, I mean, the numbers are compelling, but you've also done some of the, you've crunched the objective numbers, what it costs, what the returns are. It's not just, you know, more lamb survival is great, but it is more than offsetting the cost of the system, isn't it? Yeah, the original intention wasn't to make money. Um, it, it was about addressing an animal welfare issue. And... We've certainly done, which is hugely rewarding. A, a bonus is having the system um, being profitable. Um, so if you look at the indoor system installation, um, we, we've simplified the system down. So it costs around ten dollars uh, per mm -hmm. to feed, um, but saving half of those triplet actually, if they're worth a hundred and twenty wings as a store or $180 as a prime land, the, the indoor profit in isolation is sort of reaching the 10 block, but you have to look at the to the farm system, where if we've dropped on a 25% death farm wide, then to 50 um, yeah, the, the farm wide profit is, is approaching $34,000 and critics might say, oh, that's not all lambing, it's some genetics or possibly the climate and if you comment I'm sure it had played a part but it's awfully coincident we've had some improvement lambs of all since yep. 2017 we started the lambing. Yeah I just wonder um, we've possibly been focusing a bit too much on um, production and and agricultural history and that we should be more aware of environmental and um, and welfare issues. So um, the fact that the uh, indoor land tick box is also profitable is a um, is a win-win situation. It's actually achieving all Probably of the above, isn't it? Just while we're on the topic, Aaron, it's really important to note um, while, while the indoor system, well, I, I dare say after 
five runs at the set of comments, been a home run for us. Wouldn't want to suggest uh, similar results related elsewhere. I mean, potentially they could be if people want to give it a real go. But there's aspects of our operation in our farm which do make it work. Like I said earlier, we've got got great infrastructure in place um, to do it. We've got the labour available. Um, sheep are, are really used to being handled. They're used to being in the yards, and, uh, having work with them. Um, doesn't get particularly wet and cold, which might sound counterproductive to lambing indoors. But when the sun beams into the head and you can put the roller doors open at 7.30 in the morning in the winter, I, I think the clean is on. At the, it's a very healthy environment. We don't seem to get those into animal health issues. Other people have found. So if people wanted to give it a go, I would say just dip your toe in the water, follow best practice like we did in year one, and um, you might decide it's not for you. But, you know, winner and, and you could could do a little bit one year. You mentioned the labour side of things there, Richard, I think, um, and that's in your estimates of costs and margins, does that include an allowance for labour or is that you're doing that effectively in kind with, when you're there anyway? Um, oh, in my original calculations, I, I did include labour and I'll just look up here what the were. Yeah, this demonstrates sort of shift in the system. In 2017, the labour came to $54 a year. I think I was working on paying someone $25 an hour for time yeah. hours per year. Per year. Uh, my labour cost was $25 and then $25. Um, and of course, now doing the, the hoggets indoors as well, the cost per animal would, would be going down all the time as we gain those efficiencies. Um, so. Yeah, it may sound labour intensive, but while I was managing the indoor operation, I was also doing daily farm tasks. I was out shifting the um, brakes and other odd jobs. So, um, yeah, sort of a low input system or sort of as simple as indoor lambing can get, I suppose. And um, being it was a Beef and Lamb New Zealand Innovation Farm project, there's a bit of stuff written up about this too, isn't there, if people want to read more? Yeah, very much so. There's um, been various newspaper reports and um, I think there's a couple of, um, a bit of info on the Beef and Lamb website about it. Um, there's there's good good breakdown of all those costs and the benefits um, out there if people want want to look at it. But hey, look, just um, we keep moving on because it wasn't all about sheep, but it has been so far. Um, the cattle side of things, it's still uh, a significant proportion of units of cattle, but What's the role of cattle in the system? It, it's um, they support the ship system. They, they uh, how do you deal with them? I mean, that that's a, that seems like a significant proportion of cattle for somewhere that does get dry in summer. Yeah, that's fair comment, Aaron. Um, I guess to a certain degree, it occurred through accident rather than design, and that I just found it was easier to achieve a higher proportion of cattle. Um, we, we're not big on drenching young stock. Um, I, the ewe lambs were actually drenched at weaning last year, but they haven't been drenched since. So we do have a little bit of we do do a tapeworm drench at weaning, but that, that's about it. If we can uh, incorporate, integrate sheep and cattle, um, the cattle do a brilliant job in terms of vacuum cleaners, of um, uh, sucking up parasites. They're also very good at um, grooming pastures for the um, sheep. Um, carryover cows in particular have, have been um, very beneficial in that regard. Mightn't necessarily be particularly profitable every year, but certainly add a lot of value to the um, to the sheep operation. By and large, um, historically, I had a reasonably stable flock of sheep in terms of numbers, but cattle were used to soak up any uh, surpluses of feed or in times of deficit, 
cattle went. Consequently, um, over the years, we've run anything from about 35 head of cattle up to 500 head of cattle. Um, so the cattle is, is very much a relief valve in terms of um, giving us a little bit of flexibility, but um, it does certainly um, make attaining your sheep goals much higher than what you'd consider a desirable proportion of cattle. So I won't, I won't say, we'll avoid the word complex with your cattle system, but it, it's reasonably variable or varied, is it? You have a, I think from what you're saying, you have carryover, dairy cows, there's some bulls going in there and, and what do you run and is it is it constant year to year or do you just take opportunities as they, they come and go to, to be that, give you that flexibility of sheep? Actually, it's, it's interesting in that the uh, the cattle enterprise was described as complex during the monitor farm. Uh, consequently, one very astute um, of the farmer council um, just came to the fence and said that it's not complex; it's just flexible trading. <laughs> yeah. Consequently, start of April. When you had a good idea of um, how your winter green feed crops were establishing and, and what your pasture covers were over the property and then just work out how many cattle was able to um, winter and would then just go out on the market and source whatever was the best value for money, um, which was relatively easy to do with a very proactive, um, very competent stock agent. So we we thought of these enterprises by um, by accident, um, but funny enough, they they don't high demand animals and they do tend to um, copy each other and integrate quite well. So you don't actually have any breeding cattle on, do you? You're not you don't do any calf anything like that. It's all finishing, no. trading, fattening kind very, of stuff. Yeah, very much very much a trading operation. If the sheep out breeding and finishing, mm -hmm. the cattle is um, strictly trading. So. so so a component to it, um, Aaron, is is the the Jersey bulls, which we a um, soil moisture is at January the October. Um, when do you think sort of people will actually leave the farm to um, go out for mate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the um, same third yep. week of October. So um, by the by the Jersey bulls as a as a bull calf at 100 kilos in December. Uh, grew those out a target of 300 kilos the following for the following hope when they're used for mating they come back farm um, and your feed on them through to October uh, left out the, off the farm for two or three months back late January and actually carry them through that next winter as a three-year-old when they're finally sold in October, they're sold to the dairy farmer who uses uses them for mating, and then they're off to the works. So, while while you are carrying a, a bull for three years, it's actually off farm for about six of those months, and it's actually when we're we're drying drying up, um, yeah, hitting that soil moisture deficit. So, the Jersey bull trading certainly. Um, fits in with with the system well. Um, we will buy 40 Frisian bull calves at the same time, and they're a straight fattening proposition. Uh, goal is to do a kilo a day and sell them as a two-year-old at a target carcass weight of 360 kilos. You'll be horrified, Aaron, at um, how little feed you can winter a uh, Jersey bull or a carryover cow on, but then open the gates when the um, oh. feed comes away in the spring. That's the most impressive thing because their selection for feed conversion efficiency, especially those carryover cows, what they'll what they will live on and where they live on, but that's a whole other story. I haven't seen some of them, some of the places they experimented with them down here. But so, what is the carryover cows? You do them every year, or are they something uh, flexible depending on feed and that feed plan you talked about, feed budget? The actual cow itself is, is such an integral part of the um, yeah. system. The numbers what varies yeah. from um, from year to year. Um, yep, so um, that's very much just um, a, a sort of um, available feed. So significant part of your stock units, and, and we've talked about what's comprised, but I guess, you know, it's, it's a, other than that, it is a fairly straight system. They're there to turn feed into beef and or go away and turn uh, into um, calves for dairy farmers, I guess, is sort of the, the theme. But um, the, the complex
aspects of the system, arguably, where you're having to rear hog it, hog it lambing and all these things we were talking about, lamb survival, etc. There's, there's actually not that level of complexity to it. Yeah, it's the and um, the beauty of the jerseys is, yeah, they're converting feed, but it's it's very average feed. The, the 40 Frisian bull calves, um, I guess they're competing directly with the sheep. You really want to pump the high quality feed into them. They will do a bit of a clean up job through the summer where required, but generally they want priority feeding. Whereas, well, the Jews in year one get up to that 300 kilo the um, first October, but as a two and a three year old, it's it's quite low quality feed you're giving them. So mm. while, while on a 12 month basis, the Frisians are more profitable if you analyze it per megajoule of metabolizable energy, the um, the jersey will certainly win, hands down. So why do you have the Frisians when you've got that the, the jerseys work with them being away and, and, and then, as you say, in the last couple of years, they're living on poorer quality feed or lesser quality feed? What's the role of the Frisians, those 40 Frisian bulls? That's historically obviously a bit of a butt error. But, um, if the pressure came on, you, you can um, turn the animals um, on the telephone overnight. Yep. But... Yeah, it's a bit hard to, um, to to sell them, be given their profitability. So uh, we will throw some supplements at them if necessary to get through a yeah, a short term um, pinch. We will wrap it up there because we have gone a wee bit longer than we thought. But again, that was because there was a lot to go through, and we wanted to do it in in some depth. So. This is going to be, uh, well, some of you will be listening to this beforehand, but this is also going to be tied in with some some video as well. So um, you'll get a chance to see some of what we've been talking about, both, I think, in a, in a bit of a webinar. And then after that, it will be online, possibly somewhere on, the, on one of the Beef and Land New Zealand um, YouTube channels or somewhere on YouTube anyway. But, look, I will wrap it up there. So, look, I just uh, say thanks very much to this, Richard Dawkins from the, the Waihopai Valley know very little about but i know a whole lot more about it now Talk to you guys so hey look thanks very much for your time thank you thanks aaron thanks aaron hello uh, simon here again can um can you see me yep we've got you loud and clear simon you have oh great Look, I was just going to yeah, say uh, uh, on behalf of the Farm of the Year Trust to thank uh, Chris and Richard again very much. I uh, think they put a lot of effort into that, and um, I think there's there's a lot there to think um, to think on for for all of us who who've watched that. I'd also th like to thank Aaron Meekle from Beef and Lamb very much, who I think did a fantastic job uh, leading and leading um, Chris and Richard through this whole webinar so look i um if if you did enjoy this please um recommend it to other farmers to to view because uh, i think i think you know the sharing of knowledge is just really helps all of us actually and there's a lot of knowledge to be shared from this production in, in my opinion so just before i hand back over to chris and richard um, for any remaining questions, to answer any remaining questions, I would just like to again acknowledge all the local sponsors who have very generously um, put money and time in to help with this competition, and in particular, the two uh, platinum sponsors, the naming rights sponsors, which is Westpac Bank and Osgrove Seed Services. So thank you very much. And now I'll hand back over to Chris and Richard for the any more questions for I think there's a few more questions there under yeah thanks very much for that Simon um, we've just given been given the hurry along by Rhiannon to be um, done by nine so we'll we'll make them um, short and snappy but can I just say if, if anyone does have any further questions um, yeah, yeah you could always contact us and we're more, more than happy to have a yarn or send an email or whatever um, so Fraser's question was uh, where are we? Chris, what have been the highlights of your farming career at the Pyramid and what excites you the most for the future of our industry? Been a lot of highlights over the um, over the decades, Fraser. To, um, just to put it into a nutshell, um, I guess if you had to isolate one particular thing, I, I'd, I'd suggest the uh, family involvement. 
I uh, bought the property when I was 23, was living up here by myself, um, but had, had a very supportive father. Um, subsequently, um, yeah, got married, so that, that was a uh, real highlight. Had family of four boys, and just the, um, the development, evolution of the uh, family, I guess, has been um, something that you don't really prepare for. So to have uh, three of them directly involved in the farm still, um, albeit in, in different aspects of the uh, property is um, is a real bonus. So um, yeah, probably um, probably the the um, evolution of the family on the on the farm. Um, earlier in the week, we went bush just an overnight. Of, um, three sons, three um, three little granddaughters, and myself. Um, stuff like that's really um, really magic. Get a lot of satisfaction out of um, working alongside your family. Um, but having said that, do value the relationships that we have with um, our service providers. Um, I enjoy the working relationship that I have with them, and they certainly uh, add a lot of value. Um, progression, I guess, has been a highlight. I like progress. I'm driven by results. Um, like to set targets and um, and tick boxes, so that that's been very rewarding. Um, a more tangible thing would probably be the uh, the trees, the, the forestry. Um, you, you fence off a rough hillside and and, and creek and planted in radiata, and thirty years later, you're sort of um, benefiting from the um, uh, from your efforts in that regard. So that's been um, been quite rewarding. Um, as to the future, um, hopefully a harmonious family um, working together, albeit in, in slightly different um, aspects of the business, but interrelated. Thanks, Simon. Very good. I'll go to Rhiannon's question. Indoor lambing is traditionally a UK practice. Do you think you are turning away from New Zealand's competitive advantage with outdoor systems? Um, the, yeah, this is a really good question and um, yeah, one, one that does get mentioned occasionally. Um, I'm not overly familiar with the US indoors for a significant period of time. Um, our use of ram harnesses allows us to pinpoint the lambing date. User only actually inside for an average of four or five days. So when you say to someone you're indoor lambing, they sort of picture that you've got a thousand ewes undercover for, for months on end or something. But um, it's, it's strictly those at risk animals, um, being the triplets and the hoggets. Um, we also did the singles last year. Um, and, and yeah, inside for a, for a very short period of time. Um, if, if we think about the bigger picture, we really have to be proactive around animal health and, and of course, land survival. Where these days we are pushing genetics um, to the limit a wee bit in terms of fecundity and, and, and lamb deaths could potentially be an issue for the industry. Um, Dad fenced off our waterways in the 80s, so the stock exclusion regulations coming up, we're, we're sort of well ahead of the game. And I like to think further down the line, if there is more focus on lamb wastage, um, we'll be well ahead of the pack. I, I certainly don't think everyone should should or need to lamb indoors. In fact, it can cause more, more harm than good um, in some situations. But I, I, think, I think you need to have a plan um, from an animal welfare standpoint. Um, yeah, if not from that standpoint, even even straight economics, when you're cutting your lamb death rates from 24% to 13 or 14 or 15%, it um, yeah certainly helps out bank balance. All right, next question. Uh, JV Scott said feed budgeting by eye mostly. Um, Dad's done 40 years of feed planning, so. Um, I'm, I'm probably quite analytical by nature, so um, enjoy uh, feed budgeting, feed planning, feed allocation. Um, I guess um, historically, I um, tended to use a lot of, um, of reasonably um, subjective information, whereas nowadays, um, with, with experience, I suppose, um, have got a, a pretty good system. Um, supply climate data on a uh, weekly basis to a, uh, 
uh, a guy in Blenheim who has a locally based climate report and um, he has actually come up with a predictive pasture growth rate model using information that um, I supplied a long time ago where we were um, cutting and weighing on a, uh, on a fortnightly basis. And um, he, he's come up with a predictive model, which we use a lot in terms of um, our pasture planning and, um, and feed budgeting. So um, I would like to think that's probably um, one of the strengths of our operation. Very good. Uh, Lucy said, should more farmers look at incorporating dairy beef and where is the best money? Um, probably a bit like the indoor lambing. It's, it's a certainly very, very good in our situation. I, I suppose it does come with some challenges. Um, again, being third generation on the property, I'm, I'm quite blessed with extensive laneway systems and uh, electric fencing. Um, they, a very good stock agent that we've been with, with for decades. Um, so, so walking into that setup um, certainly makes it was very straightforward for me. Um, what would you say about other people getting into it? Uh, dairy beef, um, bull beef, Frisians, like they, they really enjoy wrecking gates, wrecking fences, wrecking water troughs, wrecking trees. Um, yeah, do, do need a, a system in place, but um, with good water supply and, um, and electrified uh, fences, they can be very rewarding. Um, yes, I, I've always enjoyed the bulls because um, of their feed conversion and very easy to um, trade in, just buy and sell them over the telephone. So um, suits us, it's, it's, it's a great opportunity. I enjoy bulls. Um, yeah, I assume that possibly not for everyone, otherwise uh, there'd be more about. But a criminal killing bobby calf at four days old when there's a potential to carry it on to much greater weights. Right, two questions to go. So we'll give some quick fire answers. Um, being the third generation on the property, what are some major developments you would like to undertake? Um, yes, third generation, but we've almost set ourselves back um, 30 or 40 years with the development of vineyards on our best land, we've lost 100 hectares of lambing platform and replaced it with the 187 hectare tunnel block. So um, yeah, flat out developing that. We've um, done the hard stuff in terms of removing weeds, improving fur, fertility, um, improving pastures, but um, uh, planting trees. There's um, plenty more to do in terms of subdivision and reticulated water. So um, yeah, we'll continue to develop the tunnel block. Um, potential for a, a third vineyard development, but um, don't want to, to compromise the livestock operations. So we'd certainly want to expand the pastoral platform first. And second question from Ali, how often do you monitor your outdoor lambing use? Do you intensively manage them too? Uh, I, I man the indoor operation and um, dad, dad does the twins outside. So yeah, they, they're also checked within a daily outdoor lambing beat. And if any ewes are having a, a, a problem, we'll probably go back and check them a, a second time in the same day. Should that wrap it up, Simon? Yep, look, that's absolutely fantastic, guys. Um, and yeah, certainly a comment that I would make is I, I think this webinar and the Q&A that's gone with it has really added an extra dimension to what you can get from a field day. I'll be really interested to hear comments from others, not not tonight. We've done really well tonight, I think. Um, but uh, look, thank you everybody for joining, and um, and the Dawkins family again, um, and um, all the best. Good night. Thank you, Simon. Thanks, everyone.